Hello and welcome to this update for January of 2022. We will be discussing the Omicron variant as well as some new data from the BC CDC, the medication Paxlovid, some interesting information on masks, as well as some new data that we have out on how the SARS-CoV-2 virus can spread through different body tissues and why you really still want to avoid getting this infection if at all possible. Let's dig into the data that we have today. All right, so quickly we will look at what is going on in the world. Now I've just picked a few countries here where most of my viewership comes from. However, I know there are others of you, so please don't feel left out. Let me know in the comments where you're from and I'll try to include you on these graphs in the future. Uh, so it's no longer helpful to just look at cases because we know that many places in the world uh, testing has not been accessible or it's been overwhelmed or it's being limited like where i live in british columbia it's being limited to people who are more high risk high priority groups so i just wanted to compare here if you look at the uh, number of vaccine doses in these countries and then you can go and over and look at new cases per 1 million people you can see that in most of these countries cases are starting to drop off however we don't really know uh, in many places, whether this is just because testing is being overwhelmed or people aren't seeking testing or whether there is an actual drop. Now, there are places in Canada that are monitoring, monitoring wastewater and there are indications that indeed the viral load is dropping. Patients in ICU continue to increase in many places and the new deaths per 1 million also continue to increase because we know that deaths are a lagging indicator. So with deaths as a lagging indicator, um, many people <laughs> are wanting this pandemic to be over and trying to say that this is becoming endemic and maybe it is, um, but we still have a lot of people that are getting sick and some are going to hospital as well. And I'll have some more uh, input or insights on that for you in a moment. So here in British Columbia, uh, it's been a difficult few weeks as I know it has been throughout the globe. Uh, we have very limited PCR testing, so if you do not have other conditions, if you are not a high-risk group, you are not to seek testing. If you do get sick, you are to stay home and self-isolate until your symptoms resolve. Uh, our, our medical health officer yesterday uh, announced that contact tracing is no longer useful. It's been overwhelmed for quite a while, and it sounds like contact tracing will no longer be occurring in most cases. Uh, and uh, something that was quite surprising is that they announced that COVID-19 positive patients can now share hospital rooms with fully vaccinated patients in some areas. Uh, this is somewhat concerning. Um, quite a few scientists are ra raising some concerns over this. I'm not one to say too much about it. I'm just reporting what's going on. And isolation is no longer required for the close contacts of positive cases. This is also concerning. And I know of cases where someone has had someone who's COVID-19 positive in their household and they've continued going to work and because they feel fine. And as it turns out, they end up being positive in a few days. And I'll have some insights on rapid testing and when your rapid test is going to show up positive. And it's actually not until you've been symptomatic for a couple of days. So I don't think that this isolation policy, although it may keep people working more, it may also contribute to spread of disease in some cases. And that is concerning. The BCCDC did also release some excellent data that gives us insight on who is more at risk for more severe illness and age remains the most uh, serious predictor of the most obvious predictor of more severe disease and as you get younger as long as you don't have any other uh, chronic illnesses or comorbidities uh, you have less risk especially of course if you are vaccinated so in this graph, persons age 80 and over are an estimated 28 times more likely to be hospitalized should they contact COVID-19, and they are controlling for other factors here. Whereas persons with three doses of COVID-19 vaccine are an estimated nine times less likely to be hospitalized, controlling for other factors as well. And you can see how pregnancy, diabetes, respiratory diseases, and heart conditions also put you at 
increased risk. So that was a good graph to have a look at yesterday. They've also looked at hospitalization by risk categories. So they looked at the period of September 30th to October 27th versus which is when Delta was dominant and December 14th to January 6th when Omicron was dominant. And so you can see that there is a drastic decrease in risk of hospitalizations uh, during this time for people who are at very high risk, and then it goes through high risk and medium risk. So the risk of hospitalization among confirmed cases is much lower in the current wave compared to before, even among the population at high risk of hospitalization from COVID-19. So that's good news. But what's complicated is that so many more people are getting sick that you will still see more people going to hospital than in previous waves. And this is what they're trying to, to prevent through some of these mitigation measures, although some of the measures are now going to start to be lifted soon. Risk of hospitalization from COVID-19 by age group. So this just confirms that the older you are, the higher the risk you have within each age cohort, those who are not fully immunized and with at-risk conditions are in the highest, highest risk category, okay? This graph, and I'm going to put the links to all of these graphs in the description of this video. I always do that. My references are always in the description if you want any further information, and you should really go in and, and read it yourself. Um, but this graph looks at the risk of hospitalization by uh, so male and female, by age, and also by vaccination status. So if you've not had any doses of vaccine versus if you've had one vaccine dose, two vaccine doses, or three, and also whether you have any other comorbidities that put you at higher risk. So you can look at yourself here, you can look up your age, you can look at how many doses you've had, and you can see right now during the pandemic, this is specific to British Columbia, but I'm sure you could apply this to other places in the world, what your risk is of severe disease. And you can see that with increased doses of the vaccination, you are at less, less risk. Um, but it's a really good uh, visual to look at and to calculate your risk and the risk of your family, one dose versus two doses versus three doses. It really creates a, a tangible way to look at what your risk is for severe disease. So Paxlovid was approved by Health Canada recently, and I was asked this week, do you think that Paxlovid will be a game changer? And I said, well, it might be if we have supply. So Ontario is just putting out guidance on how they are going to use Paxlovid, and they're only going to use this. So Paxlovid is an, sorry, is an oral antiviral. It's a five-day treatment, so it can be taken from home, and Pfizer showed about an 89% efficacy rate in this in their clinical trials, although we have not yet seen the peer-reviewed publication for this. So the idea with Paxlovid is that it stops the virus from replicating in the body, therefore inhibiting the cytokine storm, that hyper-inflammatory response that we see with people who become severely ill from COVID-19. So Ontario just released their guidance, and so I put in a few notes here because I do think that other provinces will probably do something similar, and I know that BC will be prioritizing the doses that they have for high-risk individuals. So here are the notes that I took from that. So the clinical trials looked at high-risk patients only. And they did not mention the use of Paxlovid in low risk individuals, other than in a brief segment that I'll show you in a moment. We don't have a scientific publication or full manuscript. It's not posted online and it's not in a scientific journal. We just have what was submitted to Health Canada. And although that is quite extensive, that information, it's not the same as a peer reviewed publication at this time. So they anal analyzed 2,426 high-risk patients, and in those high-risk patients, they showed about 87% eff efficacy, and they said that high risk to them was having a 6.5% risk of hospitalization. Now, that really depends on where you are. So different hospitals and different areas will have a different definition of what they consider to be high risk, and it's dependent on age, it's dependent on their health status. And so that is quite a variable figure. We don't have any knowledge of the medical complexities of the patients who were in the trial, other than the fact that they were high risk. Paxlovid has a lot of different drug interactions. It's two different therapeutic ingredients, and it 
inhibits an, a group of enzymes in the liver called cytochrome P450. And this causes a multitude of drug interactions. And so when you're dealing with high risk patients, often they have a lot of different chronic illnesses, they're on a lot of different medications. And so it will be tricky, but very possible with the help of a pharmacist to manage these drug interactions. There are also some warnings about if you have reduced kidney function or liver function, that also needs to be considered when you're using this medication. The medication, like I said, has to be given early. So you need to know that you have SARS-CoV-2 within five days of symptoms. And that's when you need to start the treatment. Also, the supply is limited. It's going to be limited in Canada and throughout the US. It's not the easiest drug to produce. So will it be a game changer? I think that it will be an added tool for us. I don't think it will change the game right now. It's not going to be for children. Children under five cannot get vaccinated. It's not going to be for pregnant women. And it's not going to be for low risk individuals right now. So it's an added tool and hopefully it will help to keep some of these more high risk people out of hospital. So this was a statement that was released uh, from these clinical trials. So this statement is the interim analysis of the phase two, three study, which included unvaccinated adults who were at standard risk. So low risk of hospitalization or death, as well as vaccinated adults who had one or more risk factors for progressing to severe illness showed that the novel primary endpoint of self-reported sustained alleviation of all symptoms for four consecutive days as compared to placebo was not met. So this might not even be effective in people who are not high risk who just don't have enough information right now. And this may be part of the reason why more high risk people are being prioritized for this therapeutic. There's been a lot of uh, interest and confusion around rapid tests. And so this is a graph that has been going around that I'm not sure if I've shared with you before. Uh, but the rapid tests themselves, I've said this before, that they're very, very time sensitive. And it is true that you could be spreading the virus before you are symptomatic. And if you take a rapid test, just because you've been around someone who has COVID-19 and you are asymptomatic, the likelihood of having a negative result is quite high. However, if you are two to three days into symptoms, the likelihood of having a positive result is quite a bit higher. So what's happening is we're probably seeing a lot of asymptomatic spread of this disease right now. And so you can look at this graph and it shows you the infectious period that can be detectable by a rapid test and also by PCR. And most people, many people do not have access to PCR right now. So we're really depending on uh, our self-monitoring of symptoms as well as rapid tests. So I'll have some guidance for that on you for you in a moment. There is an increasing thought <laughs> that is circulating that Omicron is mild, this is going to become endemic and the pandemic is going to be over. Omicron is not mild for a lot of people. It is not mild if you are not vaccinated, if you are immune compromised, uh, if you are under five, although most kids are okay, um, we are seeing even South Africa reported increasing incidences of hospitalization in children. So this remains a virus that I don't think you should just haphazardly expose yourself to or risk yourself getting. Uh, we still see long COVID in a lot of people who have had SARS-CoV-2, even mild infections months and months ago, if not now, years ago. So there's a few studies that were released recently. So a longitudinal analysis that revealed a high prevalence of Epstein-Barr virus associated with MS. It's long been thought that Epstein-Barr virus may be associated with MS. However, now there is more uh, conclusive evidence, I wouldn't say it's totally conclusive, but very convincing evidence that this virus could cause MS. There is no reason that SARS-CoV-2, we have no reason to think that this could not cause neurological issues down the road that we still haven't seen. This virus has only been with us for about two years. Another study that was released showing that SARS-CoV-2 appears to persist in organs throughout the body for months. So patients who had infections months and months ago, they have looked at these patients and they've been able to find virus in every single tissue of the body after the person has co completely recovered. So, you know, the fact that this is able to infiltrate so many places in the body and still be found months later is very concerning. Professor Akiko Iwasaki does great research. She's a virologist. Follow her on Twitter at Viruses Immunity. She has excellent information. 
and she is looking at the neurological effects of long COVID. And she says, how can a mild respiratory SARS-CoV-2 infection lead to longitudinal neurological symptoms? Well, possibly through direct infection of the brain, possibly through autoimmunity, and possibly through inflammatory impact of infection distal to the brain, so away from the brain. And so she's studying this and she's seeing that there are possible neurological consequences. And we are seeing this in patients as well. If you look for five minutes at long COVID patients and what they are reporting, it's quite obvious that their uh, nervous systems have been affected by the virus. And so I do think that it's still best to prevent yourself from being infected with this virus, or at least mitigate that through vaccination, which allows your body to respond quicker. So you do not end up with a more severe and more dispersed infection. So a lot of people have sought out higher quality masks. However, there are a lot of counterfeits out there. And so I'm going to give you some advice on how you can detect whether your mask is fake or whether it is genuine. So start with the packaging. So the box, the, the box should have the manufacturer's name and address clearly labeled. It should be sealed. The packaging inside should be sealed and it should be evident that it has not been tampered with. Some people have reported they buy these masks and they come in a plastic packaging with like a twist tie or something on it. That is not acceptable. And that could indicate that the mask has been tampered with. These masks should also come with an expiry date on the packaging. So the expiry dates uh, are important because the N95 masks carry an electrostatic charge that does not last forever. And also the straps will wear out over time. So an expiry date should always be present on a mask that meets manufacturing standards. If you see FDA approved, FDA registered or FDA listed, these should be red flags because the FDA does not approve masks in the United States. It's NIOSH or NIOSH is the entity that approves these masks and gives their certification of approval. So it has nothing to do with the FDA. And if you see this on any of the packaging, it is a red flag and an indication that this is probably not a high quality mask. On the mask itself, there should be some kind of branding with the name of the company or the logo right on the mask. Observe the mask for quality control issues like a crooked nose wire or elastics that stretch or detach easily. And remember when you put on your mask, it's really important that you try to get the best seal possible in order for it to be effective. So as far as N95s, if this NEOSH mark is missing or it's spelled incorrectly, that is a red flag and in Canada, the mask itself or on the packaging should have this TC84A and then a four digit number stamp on the mask. And then there are other products that are marked with the indications that I'm showing you here. For medical masks in Canada, look for this ASTM F2100 or EN14683 on the packaging label. Beware of masks that do not have any approval number whatsoever. So if you have masks at home, you can go and look and see whether you actually have a mask that is authentic. You can store and clean your mask in a brown paper bag. After about 24 to 48 hours, it will be ready to use again. If you look online, there are ways also to sanitize your mask in the microwave. However, be careful. Don't burn yourself. It's using steam, which is uh, hot water. And uh, there are great tutorials online about how to do that. Uh, using your using your microwave at home. Please be careful. Well, I hope you found that helpful. Thank you so much for joining me. Please do take a moment to take care of your mental health today and try to prioritize that every single day. Routine is important. Eating healthy foods that you can prepare yourself is also important. Being exposed to light every day, be that artificial light or being outside in the sun, also very important. Don't overdose on vitamin D or vitamin C. Please follow the guidelines. And I look forward to our next update. Take care and stay healthy. Bye-bye.